Welcome to the show. They stood, that was fun. I feel like the people always stand. Like, your special, what I really enjoyed about it is you have cultivated a fan base which is genuine, and most importantly, you grew them from the ground up. It's something I've always been impressed by is you, 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 you got into comedy, and it seemed like you were hitting a lot of brick walls, and then you were just like, well, I'm just, I'm just gonna create my own lane, and that's something that you've done successfully. Is, th is that how you see your comedy career? Um, I think, I feel like that's been my career in general. You wow. know, I think that for, for most black women, that's our career. Like, we're hitting walls and we're like, you know what? Right. <laughs> I'ma build this ladder, I'ma build this bridge. You know what, I'ma just float. I'ma levitate over these fools. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's really what ends up having to be the course of action out right. of this necessity. And now, I mean, it, it, it's one thing to have your first comedy special. HBO is a monument that most comedians dream of. That, that is, uh, it, it's, it's not just a funny show, but it's on HBO. Was that a dream of yours, or was that something that just became like a, a bonus of having a great special? It was actually a bonus. I mean, for all intents and purposes, I was just gonna do it myself. Right. Like, I feel like I have such a strong following of folks that are action-based and that really, like, give me the encouragement to feel like, you know what, I'll just create my own independent stream of income and I'll just do it myself. If Louis C.K. can do it, I can do it, because black women can do anything. And, but then HBO was like, no, 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 we got you, boo. And <laughs> so, I was like, oh, so I don't have to spend my own money and I can try and pay off my mama house? Great. Right. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Um, the special is something that is 100% Amanda. Right? And one thing that I've seen many people say about you, which I completely agree with, is you speak in... It's like your voice is un, unfiltered, untampered with. It is like... It is the truest essence of what many comedians wish they could do when they're on stage. Is this something you always had when you were a comedian? <laughs> or...? Okay, Trevor. <laughs> no, Public <but> I... props. <laughs> um... Public props? <laughs> <laughs> You know, people give you props in your DMs, but it's one thing to do it, like, on the TV. Right, but, uh, <laughs> but you're really good, though. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, my mother... I feel like I come from a, a family of people who... I wouldn't say we're unfiltered. I think we just have different filters. Right. I think for a lot of people, fear is the filter. And for me, that's just not the case. I'm not really afraid of if people will like me. I'm more fearful that I will be misinterpreted as saying something other than what I really mean. Wow. Do you think your mom encouraged that? Because I've seen you, you know, post stories. You, you, you tell, uh, you know, a lot of stories on Instagram. You share a lot about your life. And I remember you had, like, a series about you as a young child and how your mom encouraged you to do things that were outside of your world. Do you yeah. think a lot of that formed who you are as a person today? Oh, one million percent. Because I really believe in just having like a number of different perspectives to be able to form and help broaden your own, right? right? So, I mean, early on, I was doing a lot of different activities and my mom just really operated under the banner of, if she wants to try it and I can make it happen, let me at least let her try it. Right. If I want her to try something and she's against it, she gonna try it. You know, that was... <laughs> but I think that that's... That's the kind of person that I became because I'm not afraid to take risks. Right. Because I've tried so many things and I liked and I didn't like them, but I always knew that I got back up and I could do something else. When, when, you, when you have these conversations online, you're not afraid to talk about everything. I mean, from, from race to conversations in and around gender to, to what's happening in politics. And what I've always loved is how people will jump into your mentions and they'll say things like, oh, why, why are you speaking on this? What do you even know about this? And you'd be like, well, I have a master's degree like in... Like a whole master's. Right, a whole master's <laughs> degree. <laughs> like, a, like a, a whole one. How much do you think that's informed your stand-up? Oh, my gosh. I would say it's the cornerstone. Because so much of my stand-up is about, like, not just laughing, but learning while laughing. And right. so much of stand-up is about talking about what you know. So my passion for black culture and the black experience is not just in my own existence as a black person, but in the actual academic study that I've done uh -huh. about black people across the diaspora. Right. So it really is rooted in that as much as it's rooted in, like, my own personal stories of getting beat with a box on a train. But that's a whole other situation. <laughs> I've always been fascinated because I never know which way you're gonna go on a subject or an issue. Like, uh, for instance, the other day, there was a story about, you know, this, uh, I think it's a film, Cleopatra, and, the, and then people <gasps> were angry about who's gonna play Cleopatra. They're like, why are they not getting a black woman to play Cleopatra? This is racism, this is... And you came out and you were like, oh, people need to stop complaining uh, because Cleopatra wasn't black. And I was like, wow, I... I'm... Well, she's European. I mean, she was, like, brown European, but she was... <laughs> You know, I mean, she was, she was, according to historical yes. reference, many say that she was the descendant of 
Ptolemy and like Macedonian, like yes. she, but she was not like Nefertiti's cousin, sister's best friend, you know? <laughs> and I think that's what a lot of people thought. As far as I'm concerned, like, I'm just a fact-based person. Right. In the same way that like, I don't know how we're even kind of defending R. Kelly, because the facts is he's trash. <laughs> how we're like talking about other people or how we're like having these like nuanced discussions. <laughs> He's trash. You know what I... One of my favorite things about you is you, you, you have this dictionary of words that you have come up with so, like, for instance, like, what, what do you say that you said she's not European? She says she's, she's brown appearing. Brown, brown, brown appearing. I don't brown know. Brown <laughs> And then I, I remember you, you had one of my favorite things where you talked about the difference between someone being white, a white person, and someone who happens to be white. It's a strong distinction. Why did you feel the need to make that distinction? Because, partially because I feel like a lot of white people. <laughs> don't dis. They don't have a distinction amongst their group, right. right? And I think that there's a lot of folks who are like, wait, but not all, but not all, but not all. And it's like, okay, here's something for you. Right. But I also think that the, the, we don't care about the not all, you know, like, but not all, because there's so many doing the BS. Right. Right? So when I make that distinction, it's to also for folks who have allies and who know allies to be able to point out, this is an example of what you should be, you know? And I think that is important because you can complain, 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 but if you can't identify like a version of what it is to be on the right side of something, right. then it's hard to point people in the right direction. People who happen to be white, white people. People who happen to be white, you know what, watch the special, I explain that. That's, that's a nice hook. I like that, that's a great hook. You've got... You've got the special. Mm -hmm. um, you've got your podcast as well. You've got a small show, doses. right? Small doses. You've got a show that's really successful around the country that you've been like doing, and it's it's not just a comedy show. It's smart, funny, and black. It's a live music comedy game show experience. Right, but the game show element is what makes it really interesting, and people love that. W explain the game show to the audience at home, because you, you want to go catch the show if you can. What, what is the game show element of this about? So we bring on two funny folks, so it doesn't have to be comedians, but two people who are notable and right. have a sense of humor. And I write games that test their knowledge of black culture, black history, and the black experience. Within that format, we have a moment of ebony excellence. Yeah. We have musical sing-alongs. We have information points of view, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so it really is just about edutainment. That's what it's really about. It's right. finding a creative way to bring information and education into a space that is lively and entertaining and at the same time empowering and enriching. Is, is that something you identified from uh, your master's degree in African studies? What, was there something African with American African American studies is the, um, the disconnect between how America tells its story and the story of black people in America being excluded from that? Oh, you're trying to get knowledgeable, okay. Um, <laughs> okay, here, we showed up, okay. Here's one thing about black folks. We love entertainment, right. okay? If there were DJs at every voting booth, I mean, <laughs> this situation never would have happened. <laughs> okay? You gotta know your culture, you gotta know your people. Yes. You know what I'm saying? And so, I, when, I, when I say that, it's like, we really thrive in that space. And so if I can use that space to also empower us and enrich us, then what's the hurt, right? right. But I think that there's a disconnect often just in terms of the amount of negative imagery of black folks that we're getting. And I wanted to create a celebratory space. Right. I wanted to create a safe space because we don't have a living color anymore. We don't have Def Comedy Jam anymore. We don't have the Chappelle Show anymore. So Smart Funny in Black, I've kept it as a live show because I'm in control of it. Right. That's what helps keep it safe. Because once you put it on the TV, then people get in control of it that don't have black empowerment as their bottom line. Is, is that your dream then, to grow into a space where you can create that type of content in a way that you can curate it the way you want it to be curated? Yeah, 1,000%. Because I... 
Commerce has never been the root of my work. Right. It's a byproduct, just like fame has never been the root of my work. It's a byproduct. So I always create art that speaks for me and hopefully speaks and helps people. So being able to do that without having to answer to like, well, white people like this right. is incredibly important. And that is a question I was asked several times, both times that I sold this show and took it back. Wow. Well, I'll tell you this. Uh... Black people will like the show, and I think white people will love it as well. It's super funny. Congrats on the HBO Anybody special. Anybody who's authentic will anyone, love who it. Loved, anyone will love the show. Congratulations. Thank you for being on the show. Ivy Nolan, for me, is January 26th at 10 p.m. on HBO. It's really special. Amanda Seals, everybody.